Okay, so welcome everybody on behalf of the Commercial Marine Network in partnership with the Maritime Journal and Sea Work and in association with the Workboat Association. The idea for these sessions began at the beginning of 2020 following a UK Clean Maritime Function to celebrate one year of the UK's Clean Maritime Plan 2050 and to discuss further its implementation. I discussed with the Seawork team that the Workboat Association would be forming a technical work group and that using the Seawork exhibition as a platform, we would like to launch it in collaboration with the event organisers at Seawork 2020. Well, sadly, due to COVID-19, Seawork 2020 did not go ahead as scheduled on its original dates. But what this has left us is this fantastic opportunity uh, for this series of sessions through the Commercial Marine Network. So thank you to Makata Media, the Seawork, Maritime Journal and Commercial Marine Network teams. And thank you to all, wherever you are, uh, for joining us here today, um, where we have around 300 or over 300 people registered and hopefully a great deal of those joining us live. Today's session will be looking at the short term implementation from 2020 to 2025 as we look to steer towards meeting the objectives of the Clean Maritime Plan. We look at current biofuel choices and optimising existing diesel engines using new fuels in existing engines. Today we've got some great speakers of whom we'll be introduced to you shortly, but first of all, I just want to talk to you about some web webinar etiquette and functions. And we need to advise delegates that today's session is being recorded. So if you want to catch up with anything that was discussed today, this will be emailed to delegates uh, who have registered in hopefully uh, no less than 48 hours following this webinar. So there is a public chat function available for use throughout the session, which we welcome delegates to use to make any introductions or comments, but please do not use this chat function to ask questions and I'll discuss why soon. There's also a private chat function. If you have any issues or comments for the host, please use the private section of the chat function, which allows you to send private messages to specific people. And the admins for the session will also be listed there. There is a Q&A section function, which will give the opportunity for delegates to ask questions to the panel, which will be answered at the end of today's session. This feature is found next to the chat function. So please type any questions in here throughout the event and the moderator will read these out. If you are directing your question to a specific speaker, please make sure that you provide the speaker's name at the beginning of the question so it can be correctly directed. And for users of a mobile phone or tablet, if using, these uh, if using one of these, please make sure that the chat function, it could be hidden, um, but it can be accessed by clicking on a blue speech bubble icon. I hope that's clear for everybody. Um, I'm now going to hand over to the moderator, um, who is also the chairman of the Workboat Association's Technical Forum. And that is Andy Page from Chartwell Marine. So Andy, I welcome you to, to join me here. And uh, without further ado, please proceed with today's session. And I wish everyone the best of luck and, and I hope you learn lots. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Gary. Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, first of our Get Set for Workboat 2050 sessions. Uh, as Kerry mentioned, we have a, a series of um, fantastic presenters lined up today, um, uh, starting with Dr. Jonathan Williams. Um, Dr. Jonathan Williams uh, founded Marine Southeast in 2005, and he holds the position of CEO. Jonathan has led the company to become a catalyst for marine business investment in innovation and diversification. MSC is now internationally recognized as a leading European marine cluster, centered on world-class business and research capabilities in the UK's Solent region. Jonathan holds engineering degrees from Cambridge University, Imperial College London, and Cranfield University. He is a chartered engineer and a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology. Jonathan's presentation today focuses on the use of novel fuels, including barriers to entry, the glycerol and plaques alternative fuel options, 
and earlier adopters in this sector. So without further ado, uh, Jonathan, if you're uh, able to uh, set your presentation and uh, look forward to, uh, to hearing uh, on your interesting subject. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andy, for that introduction. Um, very kind and um, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for listening. So I'm Jonathan Williams. I, I as you know, run Marine Southeast, and uh, we've been carrying out a number of projects over the last few years, looking at the whole question of novel fuels. Um, and in particular, what are the re why they will be taken up and what are the barriers perhaps to them being taken up? So I'm going to just canter through a few of those activities over the next uh, next few minutes. So the first question I suppose we have to ask is, is why we need novel fuels. Um, and the obvious one, I guess, which needs little introduction is, is because we're told to through regulation. And um, we IMO um, MARPOL regulate uh, convention, of course, is one of the it's been around for a while now. It's getting steadily tighter, particularly in emission control areas. Uh, recently introduced the carbon reduction measures. Um, but I think possibly for particularly for this audience, the, the more urgent and maybe more sort of intrusive uh, impact is could well come from local bylaws. Um, and we're seeing that happening all around the world now, where uh, cities in particular are introducing restrictions on the use of fossil fuels in certain areas. Uh, and that's having an immediate and actually yeah, pretty pretty immediate effect in places like Amsterdam, already in place, uh, getting tighter in 2025. So, so this is you know, this is now really. Um, and the final reason is um, uh, reputation. Um, uh, sorry, final reason reputation, which is police operators looking at uh, environment, social, and governance factors, um, as well as commercial pressures. The uh, countries like Norway introducing things like the NOx tax which are a major driver for investment in, in, in clean, clean, clean propulsion systems. So um, what are we doing? Well, we, we, we ran a project um, called Gleams. Um, sorry, this, this one, I'll just cover this first. This is the market first before we come on to the projects. Um, so this is taken from the Clean Maritime Plan. And uh, as you can see from the from the figure here, we're talking about very large amount of uh, fuel production technology investment, eight to eleven billion. Um, this is this is uh, taken from the Clean Maritime Plan that uh, Kerry mentioned. Um, of course, big numbers, but there's also a big number down here in terms of the total consumption uh, globally of marine fuel. So conclusions that we can see, I think, are liquid fuels are still very attractive because of their energy density, they're easy to carry. Um, hybrids may well be a, uh, an interesting part for zero emissions operation. We'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but there's clearly growing interest in clean net zero fuels. So um, one of the projects that we've run to look at uh, that, that possibility uh, was looking at glycerol as a marine fuel. Uh, it's called Gleams Project. And we were working with a, a company called Aquafuel. They're one of the leaders in this particular fuel. They actually run the uh, Formula E recharging station. So they use glycerol to generate, um, to charge batteries basically, to, uh, to recharge the electric race cars, at the Formula E events. So a good track record. And you can see why they use it from the graph here. It shows the very clean characteristics of glycerol that can be achieved. Um, and you can burn it in a sta almost a standard diesel engine. You need to just to change the air inlet um, uh, arrangement slightly, but um, it can. It's a very it's a very nice solution. Um, <clears throat> we uh, built ran a project which built a little pilot uh, auxiliary engine here. You can see it on a on a work boat. Um, we exhibited this actually at Sea Work a few years ago. Got a lot of interest. Um, and the question I suppose we have to ask ourselves is if we did this a few years ago, why isn't everyone talking about glycerol and, and using it today? Um, very good question. And um, so we've looked at the barriers to try to understand what it is that, that, that governs the ability of, of operators to, to adopt novel fuels. And we can see four main categories of barrier, um, which we need really to understand. 
Uh, the first one is that um, fairly obviously we're, a lot of operators want retrofit uh, options here and um, otherwise we're restricted really to the new build market. So um, they're looking for drop-in replacements. Um, possibly um, they could introduce something more extensive when they're repowering the craft, uh, maybe hybridizing. These are, these are possibilities, but getting that retrofit capability is crucial to certainly to the 2025 market, clearly. Um, secondly is security of supply. And um, these are all fairly obvious, but actually we just need to keep them in mind. Um, you, really, you really do need to be confident that you can find bunkers where you need them. And so for this reason, we think that the early adopters are almost certainly going to be um, vessels operating from a, a, a home port where they can control uh, and have certainty that they have access to bunkers. Uh, and also the supply capacity. One of the problems with novel fuels is that often they don't have a very extensive supply capacity. So there's a risk that the fuel will not be available when you need it. Uh, so another little barrier there. Economics, of course, is always there as a, as a, as a potential barrier. And the unfortunate fact is that when you do, when you process, do any sort of fuel processing, it costs. So most of the, of the novel fuels that we've encountered and looked at tend to be more expensive than the existing incumbent fuels. Um, uh, and one of the reasons for that is that when you're talking about a novel fuel with a limited initial market, it's got a very small uh, scale of production and therefore you don't get the economies of scale that you get with a with a more uh, popular fuel. And that's inevitable when you're starting because you don't have a big market by definition. Um, so even getting the sort of 10,000 tonnes a year kind of um, production level can be extremely challenging for a, a new uh, entry fuel. Finally, compatibility. Um, is the fuel, uh, is, it, is it compliant? Um, if it's a drop-in replacement for a conventional fuel, does it invalidate the warranty in some way? You know, these are all very um, you know, questions that you really have to be thinking about. And of course, the final one is the energy content adequate to use existing fuel tanks. So a number of things which we really need to keep in mind uh, when we're thinking about novel fuels. One fuel which ticks quite a few of those boxes actually um, is this fuel called Plax. And it's made from a bio company called Recycling Technologies. They're, they're a UK company and they developed a process for converting waste plastic into uh, fuel. And they can, the nature of the process means that they can effectively dial up the characteristics that they want. So they can, they can replicate a diesel lookalike or, or indeed an HFO lookalike, controlling the wax content and other, other characteristics. So, um, very interesting. Of course, it is more expensive. And uh, so we think that, that, at least in the short term, the market for this kind of fuel is likely to be companies that have a particular reason why they need to be clean and green. So, for example, wind farm operators, we've done quite a lot of work in the wind farm sector, and those operators are really keen to decarbonize and clean up their uh, wind farm support fleets. Um, so they uh, are probably a good, a good early adopter market to go for because they have a particular reason to be willing to pay a premium uh, for the fuel. So uh, in conclusion, almost, um, I, I'm just going to run through um, what we think some key messages are. I know we're not looking at the 2050 target specifically in this event, but nonetheless, we have to consider it because what the big boys do um, will affect everyone else. Um, and this is a, just a massive problem, uh, just a capacity required globally is enormous. And I'm sure we're all aware of some of the fuels that are being looked at by the, the deep sea uh, shipping operators at the moment. Um, but certainly in the, in the nearer term, I think the move into biodiesel and biodiesel equivalents um, offering this uh, retrofit capability is probably going to be really uh, key, to, key to the future. Um, but the other point is this local air quality targets, which we have to see in the same light as the decarbonisation, because companies only want to invest once. And um, so being able to uh, 
to, to, to find low sulfur and low particulate fuels, uh, able to burn in low NOx engines, maybe with catalytic reduction. Um, so drop, that's, that's a key way forward. They're likely to be more expensive. So we need to look at those markets, which can be uh, early adopters. Um, and maybe I think that the, the idea of the hybrid drive with a novel fuel could give operators a lot of flexibility to be able to operate on zero emission where they need to, uh, but still be able to burn the fuel um, to recharge the battery when they can. So those are just a few conclusions. Um, uh, obviously, um, happy to answer any questions later on, but meanwhile, back to you, Jim. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, if it's possible, um, just stay on for a second. Uh, you could just turn your camera back on, if possible. Um, I, we just had a question. Uh, the, the intention is to ask questions uh, and answer at the end, but I thought, I thought this would be a good one um, to just raise now. Um, uh, we've had a question. Can we have a brief explanation slash definition of what uh, net zero fuels are? Um, is it possible to just give us a, uh, an answer on that one, quickly, uh, yes. uh, Jonathan? Yes, I'm very happy to do that. Um, basically, the way it works is that Ofgem in the UK um, has a, a responsibility to determine the carbon uh, loading, I suppose you could call it, of different fuels, depending on how they're made. And so, for example, the glycerol option that I mentioned is, is has a 3% carbon loading, so it's 97% zero emissions effectively, mm -hmm. because it's coming from as a byproduct from another process. And so fuels will have different carbon loadings and um, clearly the, ne the nearer we can get to, to zero with an off-jam approval, the better. Great, Thank, thanks for that explanation. Um, and, and thanks everyone. Um, as we can see the, the numbers are really coming in in terms of participants. Um, so hopefully uh, Jonathan's uh, presentation there um, give, gives everyone a, a flavour of what, what to expect from these sessions. Um, it's, uh, the intention is that we're presenting a wide range of subjects um, with um, a mission to obviously uh, see decarbonisation and meet the targets of, uh, that are set by government uh, to, towards 2050. Um, so, uh, as I say, thanks very much, Jonathan, very informative. Um, and, um, and now on to our next speaker. Um, so, uh, next we have Martin Jackson. Um, from from uh, PME Group, MAN Engines. Uh, Martin comes with over 20 years experience uh, supplying propulsion packages to all aspects of marine and off-highway market sectors. Uh, Martin has a vast knowledge base in supplying bespoke systems, um, specifically taking into account all aspects of emission reduction. Um, this includes hybrid solutions, uh, SER systems, and the potential technical advancements using alternative fuels and uh, and how this works within new and existing MAN installations. Um, so Martin's presentation today uh, will look at how MAN are developing a host of different methods um, to, uh, to reduce emissions and uh, how they're looking to optimize their engines, uh, including the use of biofuels. Um, so hopefully a good follow on um, from, from Dr. Jonathan Williams. Uh, how we might be able to use some of the alternative fuels in uh, in commercial diesel engine uh, products. Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Martin Jackson, as Andy said, from uh, uh, PME Group. We are the UK importers for MAN high-speed marine engines, which is uh, 200 to 2,000 horsepower, depending on the uh, application. And just what I want to briefly do this morning was just to show what MAN are doing uh, to take into account some of the reduced emissions and really not compromising performance or uh, whole life costs. So biofuels. Um, we are, the MAN R&D are doing a lot of work on biofuels and uh, First up, they must all comply with the standards that I've listed there, EN590 and BS2869 Part 1, Class A1. And that includes HVOs and also um, GTL fuels. 
So they've already been improved, approved in a lot of the engines, particularly the V12 engine. So, you know, the advance is there and there is the option to run on biofuels if it's classed as an option. Um, can I use biofuels? Well, it, it's fairly simple. Um, in the latest common rail engines where um, the, the, the tolerances are a lot tighter, providing we're using the biofuels that have been tested by the factory, then the answer is yes. On the older mechanical fuel systems that are out there in some of the uh, more historical engines going back a few years, the answer again is yes, you can. But there are areas that we're going to need to look at to make sure that you don't make some very expensive errors along the way. And one of the areas we're seeing some failures has been on things like fuel pumps, where some of the biofuels are attacking seals and bearings. So, you know, there are kits available that we can upgrade those. So is it a drop in fuel? It can be. Are we going to be able to accommodate all the biofuels that are out there? Probably not as, as time goes forward. Um, what, do we, what do we got to do to, um, as an engine manufacturer, look at the different types of alternative fuels that are out there? So to get an MAN approval, they will need to look at things like overall engine performance. Um, will the engine maintain its power when you're using any other form of fuel? Combustion chamber, is it burning too hot? Is it burning too cold? Is it, again, producing enough power to give the engine the performance? Is there other side effects that are going to affect the engine? Contamination of engine oils is one of the first areas we need to look at. We're conducting tests now with our oil company Fuchs, where we're looking at the, the de degrading of oils and the contamination of oils over a period of time. Um, some oils are showing some very good results and some fuels are showing some very bad results. So these are all the type of things that as an engine manufacturer we need to be, to be looking at. Again, seals and bearing integrity when we're using alternative fuels uh, or alternative power sources. Again, these will all affect the really the whole life cost of the engine and the whole life performance of the engine. As an engine manufacturer, obviously, we've got warranties and performances to maintain. And what we don't really want to see is people using a alternative fuel at the, at the expense of their engine. Uh, as we know, engines are probably the second most expensive part of any boat. So, you know, we need to avoid any any expensive errors. What else are we doing? What else are MIN doing to, to get to um, lower emissions? Well, we've obviously got the Tier 2 engines that are out and around. EPA and IMO Tier 3 engines are in production with SCR. Um, they're proving to be uh, very popular and, and producing some of the results that, that, that we like to see with reduced emissions. Stage 5, really in a very final stage of development with uh, DPF filters. Again, one of the things that's been taken into real consideration there has been things like back pressures on the engine, which reduce power. So, you know, there's been a lot of work put into that. Um, other areas, hydrogen injection, full hydrogen, all in development at the moment. In fact, MAN in Nuremberg and the University of Nuremberg have, have, are working together on H2 Development Centre. So, you know, other areas that have been looked at, ammonia and all sorts of other different types of alternative fueling. So as an engine manufacturer, we're really gearing ourselves up for, you know, moving forward and gaining the areas and offering various different options depending upon application. Really, I think the message that we're trying to put across, if, if you're not sure, then we need to ask. You know, and we're available there for... The, the technical advice as to yes or no, we can do it. Um, whole life cost analysis is a really, really big area to look at. If by saving a few pence on, on a litre of biofuel, what's it going to cost you in the future? Are there, are there side effects that are going to make it not worthwhile? Is there another option like hybrid, either serial or parallel hybrid? 
like SCR, you know, th th there could be all sorts of other alternatives. We'll look at the application with you and try and work out what you're trying to achieve. And obviously along the lines from that, we need to be able to provide the suitable aftermarket support, spare parts, service and longevity of, of operation. Um, so is it is it an easy answer? I'm afraid it isn't. Is it achievable in the long term and medium term? Yes. So, you know, all, all we ask really is, is just to ask us the questions. We can give you some answers very, very quickly. Um, and we can look at the whole area of the application. So uh, hopefully, and I'm, I'm guessing that MAN are not really the only ones that are following this, 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 this market trend at the moment. Um, and with the benefit of MAN being a worldwide based company, they're looking at activities in other parts of the world that may well uh, benefit us here in the UK or certainly in Europe. So again, you know, it's worth keeping in touch with us just to find out what development is going on. So with that, I'll just give you a few contact details here. Um, give us give give us a call. We're we're working right the way through the uh, pandemic at the moment, the lockdown period, in a safe way. So we're available at all times. Um, thank you for listening. If you could just stay on uh, for a couple of seconds there, Martin. Just got a couple of questions I'd like to, to ask as we go along. Um, so the first one is, are MAN looking at this um, throughout their engine range, um, i.e. Um, will this apply on the sort of small vessel uh, market as well as the larger uh, the larger craft? Is it is it through the whole range? Yes, it is. From the high-speed engine side of it, yeah. I mean, we've got the straight six, the V8 and the V12. As I say, from roughly 200 to 2,000 horsepower. So in the Nuremberg-based engines, yes, they are. Great. And on, and on that basis, um, certainly with respect to Tier 3, have you already got uh, any applications, um, any vessels running, um, any case studies? What, on Tier 3 with SCR? Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a few, yeah. There's one one here in the UK on the Thames. There's a couple of pilot boats um, in Europe. And also there is a, a ferry boat on one of the Italian lakes that are all under constant monitor, but it's becoming a more and more uh, acceptable reduction method now. And it works. Yeah. But it works yeah. very well. So, yeah, they're out there. And on, and on alternative fuels, set the same as well? In the UK, no, at the moment, if I'm perfectly honest, or well, not officially anyway. Um, but there are a few happening around the world. I know there's a project in Holland at the moment uh, that the results are being gained from, but it is still quite early on in the development stage. Great. And then uh, following on from that, I mean, as you say, in the UK, fairly limited knowledge, maybe a little bit of insight from what's going on in Europe. Um, one of the questions that's come in is, um, uh, and again, you might not be able to answer this immediately, um, but it'd be good to follow up afterwards if, if not. Uh, have you found an increase in, in contamination in fuel filters um, from TARS and uh, et cetera, since the introduction of biofuels? Yes. Yeah, okay. Quite simply, yes, yeah, hence my comment earlier on about uh, having to look at fuel pump seals and such like. Yeah. Um, it, it is quite a big problem. Okay, and that's something that people should be considering, obviously, for existing engines. And if they're going to buy new, um, they need to be quite clear with you prior to purchase and their intention so you can fit uh, fit those seals, etc., before before delivery. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's part of the application process. And it obviously got on knock-on effects and things like warranty and and, uh, and that type of thing. So yeah, we we need to be honest with each other right from the get-go. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and and on that, uh, following on the same question that came in from uh, from Charles Hansford, uh, was how do you feel about um, kidney loop filtration for the for when using lubrication oils? Absolutely no idea. Okay. All right, I need, need to come back on that one, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps write that one down and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. take that up with, uh, with head office uh, yeah. in Germany. Um, but Greg, I think clearly people are um, really thinking about this and uh, um, great to be uh, the participation. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Martin. Okay, um, as we said at the beginning, um, we got a lot of questions coming in, which is really, really good, and we'll, we'll bring those into the um, Q&A session uh, later on. Um, uh, but up next, um, with respect to um, alternative fuels, we have an HVO uh, expert uh, here to speak with us. 
Um, so Mark Coulter um, has worked within the fuel industry um, for over 12 years. Uh, Mark is responsible for the growth and development of commercial fuels business within the WP Group, uh, the company which Mark works for. So WP Group is a leading fuel distributor uh, headquartered uh, in Southampton here in the UK. Um, it's uh, the sort of primary focus is delivering standard and alternative fuels. Um, to various sectors, including the marine sector. Uh, as part of WP Group's fueling uh, change value proposition, uh, Mark is now responsible for delivering new and innovative products and solutions um, to the total WP offering. Um, their, their mission is to challenge the norm uh, within the fuels industry, uh, particularly around the use of alternative fuels such as HVO. Um, they're focused on improved operational efficiencies um, to try and um, use the, fuel, the correct fuel at the right time um, with a view to contribute to a transition uh, to a lower carbon future. So Mark's presentation today will focus on the use of HVO fuels, uh, the key benefits in terms of decarbonisation and impact on emissions and uh, operability and effectiveness. So Mark... Um, over to you. Look forward to uh, hearing your presentation. Thanks, Andy, and, and good morning, everyone. So um, I'm just going to talk a bit more around around HVO specifically, um, as Andy mentioned, and, and, and how it fits really within um, the UK fuels market, at least, and, and, and our experience, I guess, as a, a business supplying the fuel and, and getting to understand the fuel and the benefits it, it brings. Very brief introduction to WP, so you kind of understand our, our credentials, I guess, to, to, to be talking about this. We're a we're part within Europe, part of Move Europe, um, uh, an oils company um, consisting of, of us as a, a UK fuels business. Um, are a uh, European distributor for the mobile business, so we own the mobile um, uh, businesses within UK, France, Spain, and Portugal, and also have a professional brands division um, dealing lubricants into. Um, a lot of the automotive industry um, and then within within the globe you may be familiar with the COSAN group or a, a global energy company um, do a lot with marine lubricants in South America um, and we we fit within that global structure there um, COSAN really across fuels lubricants and, and, and energy um, gas and, and, and energy so we work with predominantly six key sectors um, supplying standard fuels and alternative fuels. And, and I guess um, as a good lead into um, alternative fuels, most of these sectors, there is becoming an increasing demand on doing things differently, challenging the norm and looking at what's out there to, to use different fuels. Everyone's on this kind of road to decarbonisation and want to know what the options are. Um, really we've you know we've been in Southampton we work a lot with with the ports and marine industry um we've probably not being a, as forthcoming or, or as much of a, a demand to understand more about alternative fuels as of yet but that is certainly increasing I think um construction and airports are certainly uh, on the increase and, and the one thing that seems to all of our conversations and all of our um, understanding our customers and the sectors is that actually HVO is starting to become more of a viable alternative for now um, to get us to this kind of net zero position in the future. So what what is HVO as a, as a, as a high level summary? It's actually a fossil free, low carbon drop in replacement for diesel and it's its feedstocks are made from complete 100 percent renewable waste. So from plant waste, food waste, um, and actually, because of that, it's it's not linked to a fossil fuel at all. The feedstock's completely renewable. Um, that provides us that provides a, a an actual rough ninety percent reduction um, in total GHG um, emissions, and and actually allows us to, um, in terms of reporting from a carbon perspective, allows a significant benefit there. Um, so, like I say, it's it's a complete drop in replacement, which is another huge benefit when there's no retrofit needed there's no um there's no real cost outlay for that it's um you can mix it with normal diesel standard diesel um it blends um and actually is a paraffinic fuel 
So Martin was just talking about um, warranties and classifications and BS 2869 for, for gas oil and EM 590 for diesel. Um, actually, HVO is given its EM 15940 classification, uh, which which consists of HVO and GTL, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk briefly on shortly. That's the paraffinic fuel classification, the fuel of no scent. So um, it's actually from a warranty perspective, from a, I guess, um, comfort in knowing that um, engine manufacturers are approving this type of fuel to have its own classification is a huge benefit and, and one of the reasons why people are seriously considering this fuel. Um, just to break down the, the, the benefits, so typically an increased storage life, the fact that HVO is high, hydro treated vegetable oil, um, when you look at the actual process of, 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 of the, the esterification process of the fuel using hydrogen instead of oxygen brings some um, stabilization benefits. So we find for sectors that are typically low turnover where it's sitting in a tank for a long time, there's there's increased storage life. Um, filters, it's, it, it's a cleaner burn, it's a cleaner fuel. I will add that actually um, when when we, we're we doing first fills with customers, it's worth bearing in mind that it does have this kind of cleaning effect on tanks. So if there's a a fuel tank um, on board or a fuel tank um, that, that has had maybe um, uh, not so much housekeeping over over the years, then it's probably worth having a look at that first because typically it can block filters and pull a lot of the, the crud through for, for want of a better word and, and block filters initially. But once that kind of challenge is overcome, it's a much cleaner burn and, and, and less maintenance. As I say, a, a, a drop in diesel, there's no... There's no issues with combining a blend of normal diesel and this um, and HVO. You can mix it with various different types of fuel, which is um, makes it very easy to use. And then this, when we talk about better for the environment around the total greenhouse gas, um, a 90 percent well to wheel. So on the tailpipe, it's not not that number. When we talk about the 90 percent reduction well to wheel, it's, it is that total embodied carbon. And, and that's purely because of the feedstock. So, um, with every batch that we get and we import in, um, we get a sustainability statement and that essentially tells us where all the feedstocks have come from. And it gives a formula that's actually recognized um, within the um, Renewable Energy Directive 2. And that formula basically says versus um, fossil fuel diesel, the reduction in total GHG um, well to wheel emissions. And Actually, when you look at the reporting of HVO within the UK and government, um, the conversion factors, um, HVO can be reported as 100% biodiesel from um, used cooking oil, which gives a significant benefit. Um, health and safety. So, like I say, from from in terms of a, a paraffinic fuel, it doesn't have any scent. So, you know, actually people, when we supply it, look at some of the samples and it's completely clear fuel. So there's no... Um, that, you know you can't it doesn't look it looks like water it has no scent um so so there's benefits there and actually although we treat a, if there's a spillage of it we will treat it as a diesel spillage there have been tests on how quickly that it's absorbed within the um within the ground um and can be considered biodegradable and then importantly as well um as jonathan mentioned earlier looking at the air quality side of things along with um the decarbonization it has a real impact on nox particular matter um, on the tailpipe so it's the com chemical composition of the product similarly to GTL that has a, a significant impact on on NOx and PM on the tailpipe we've seen around about from NOx in tests that we've done about 30 percent reduction in NOx and somewhere around 60 to 70 percent in, in, in PM um, tens I just wanted to give a quick comparison as well um, because while we're talking Different fuels um, in the market to come up really, um, GTL and HVO. You can me as, as more of a traditional biodiesel. Uh, you probably look about five years ago was typically, it was being looked at quite in, in, in intensively. Um, the issue with that, if I go back to where we're talking about warranties and the fact that HVO has a um, has its own classification of EM5, EM15940, um, the issue was with, with traditional biodiesel is that you didn't get that warranty. So there were issues around, um, uh, it, it didn't have a classification, there were issues around warranty and um, actually around the freezing point of the fuel. So when we had a cold winter, people's fuel was starting to wax up. 
so actually when you look at HVO versus the normal sort of biodiesel, um, some of, you can see that actually it has a better reduction as here too. The freezing point is is significantly low and, and I think we can all agree if we see winters like that in the UK at down at minus 40 degrees, we're probably most of us will be trying to move. And then um, when you see the reduction in NOx and the reduction in PM, um, it's, it, it can be significant. Um, Worth mentioning here in terms of GTL, you'll notice is also a very good product from a chemical composition. Um, it's, it's similar to HVO and, and it has a very similar impact on NOx and PM. The issue with GTL, if, for those of you that aren't aware of what it is, is it's gas to liquid. Um, it's still a gas feedstock, so it doesn't bring the decarbonisation benefits. It doesn't give you any kind of direct impact on, on, on reduction of carbon. Um, and then just a note. Uh, because the first question everyone asks around pricing, if you use diesel as a benchmark, HVO is 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 a premium product. It's for a combination of factors, um, you know, supply supply and demand um, impact as as with anything. Um, also, it dep very dependent on the cost of the feedstock and depending on the diesel pricing at the time. If if diesel pricing is low, the the, the difference is significant. If diesel price, pricing is high, then then it's a lot lot less, as you can imagine. Just briefly on the supply chain, so um, Neste are by far the market leaders in terms of production of HVO. Um, they are a Finnish company. Um, they came third in the Corporate Knights Top 100 sustainable, sustainable Companies last year. So for an oil refiner, pretty impressive. They're doing a lot of work around um, HVO alternative fuels. It's available at the pumps in in a lot of Scandinavian countries and Netherlands as well um, as, as, as being um onboarding HVO quite quickly um, but there are other suppliers coming online Total have just built a HVO refining capability down in Marseille um, ENI a, a trading parcel so there are other suppliers coming on board but the reality at the moment is if the world wanted to switch to HVO tomorrow we wouldn't be able to um, if the whole of the UK wanted to switch tomorrow we wouldn't be able to but I think it's a product that is increasing in terms of refining capability um, and, and it is set to be around um, I want around 13 and a half billion litres supply capability by 2023. So um, it is increasing at the, right, at the moment. There's about 8 billion litres of um, supply capability. Um, so just to give you a bit of idea on, on the supply chain at the moment in the UK, it's imported. Um, it's imported into two areas up in the northwest and down onto the Thames. It's cargoes of anywhere between three to five million litres that are coming into the UK. Um, but it is being, it's very popular in Europe at the moment. So most of the demand is, uh, the supply has been eaten up in, in, in Europe at the moment. Very briefly in terms of some OEM approvals, there's some names you'll recognise on there. This is Neste's um, approval list so they you know the majority of commercial vehicle engine manufacturers approved this this fuel and, and, and as i mentioned approved the classification of em15940 so um there's there's some on-road and uh non-road uh, approvals there just conscious of time as well so just briefly here there's a, a few case studies there has been a case study we did last year with a ferry company um that we're trying on it and really enjoyed the environmental benefits and unfortunately i think the pricing differential was was too much to continue with that supply at, at, at the time but a couple of other trials that you can see there and happy to share um further information on any of these um with, with national express and with a london borough council as well in some of their refuse trucks but some significant reductions on air quality and providing a 90% reduction in, in carbon. So Mark, well, thank you very much. Um, I think um, if, if possible, I'll invite all the other presenters to uh, come on the come on the screen as well. And uh, we'll, we'll create like a little panel um, for uh, to go through some of the questions we have. So um, uh, Jonathan and uh, Martin, if you could uh, kindly join as well. Are you there, Jonathan? Hopefully he'll uh, come in in a second. In, in the meantime, um, quite a few um, good questions come in. And uh, whilst we've uh, whilst we're on the subject of HVO, um, uh, sort of came across a little bit in the presentation, Mark. But I wondered if you could expand on how HVO is processed. Um, in terms of the actual the actual process of it, I can um, I can get some data. It's quite um, detailed, but. 
yeah. in turn, as a, at a high level, it's the feedstocks uh, it, it, predominantly in, in um, Rotterdam. It, it's coming across from Rotterdam. It's refined. The difference between that and the and the, and the process of, of of diesel is is the catalyst. So it's hydrogen instead of oxygen. So that's typically the um, the main difference. Um, but I can I'm happy to share a bit more detail around the actual sort of scientific piece. Um, I can speak to our tech guys and get a bit more detail on that and share yeah. it afterwards. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, if we could share that with our participants, it just helps everyone understand uh, uh, a little more on, on what it is. Uh, and obviously where it comes from. Um, and on the subject of, um, of uh, alternative fuel types, um, Jonathan, you mentioned um, a uh, uh, plastic waste fuel. Um, and, and I noticed you did answer uh, in the chat there, but I wondered if you could just, for the, for the wider audience, explain um, how processed plastic waste fuel is made to be green. Well, um, the main points, I suppose, for uh, or advantages that flats can bring is that its uh, its feedstock is zero sulphur. First point. So when you when you burn it, when you burn plaques, it, it's a zero SOX and it's um, zero essentially zero particulate um, combustion. Um, now some would argue, okay, it's based on fossil fuels because you make the plastics out of fossil fuels. Um, the way off-gen works is that if it, if that material would, would otherwise be wasted, you you can you know, just, this is how they work out their carbon reduction percentage. Um, so by using a, a an otherwise a waste product, effectively, um, it qualifies as a very low carbon. I don't actually have the exact figure for plaques, I'm afraid, but it's a very low carbon fuel. Yeah. So by essentially recycling, we're, we're making a net gain. Correct, correct, exactly so. So the alternative would be turning it into a park, you know, park benches, for example, or or burning it in a um, a, a waste to a waste to power plant. Um, but arguably, this is a, a more uh, effective way of doing it because you're creating a fuel which you can transport around the place. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think a question for yourself and, and Mark really as well on that subject is. Um, we talk of both these fuel types and, and the glycerol um, option there. Um, what is the availability of this uh, at wide scale? Is this available in ports um, uh, for commercial vessels, etc.? After you, Mark. For HVO? Yeah, yeah, if we start with HVO and then, and then hear about the other alternatives. Yeah, so. so Particularly within within the UK, it's available at, uh, down on the Thames and available up at um, Ellesmere Port, um, and across Europe, it is starting to um, certainly start in marine is a, is, a, is a sector it's a focus of nest days I know as well as aviation. So they you know it's available at Rotterdam, it's available at very it will be available at various ports, um, and I know the US are starting to um, onboard it as well. So it's at the moment it's it's it, 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 in terms of supply versus demand, it's definitely unbalanced. Um, <clears throat> but I think that will start to rectify itself in future years. Yeah, and, and the same for the yeah on glycerol. Um, you can't buy glycerol at the moment, to, to my knowledge, anyway, uh, in a in a port. Um, and the reason the reason is that the glycerol, which is um, traded on global market, it's a there's a massive market for glycerol. And it's a byproduct of biodiesel production, so it's, it's a lot of it around, but it's not adequately refined for burning in an engine. So if you want to burn it in an engine, you have to extract the salts which come with the crude product, um, and that obviously costs. So um, when we looked into it, we'd need to we need to get a significant customer base, customer base, maybe wind farm fleet operators, maybe one way to go. To justify building a, a, a plant uh, producing, we think something in the region of 10,000 tons a year of uh, fuel. That's quite a big ask. So there's a it's a big investment challenge here to 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 get your customers lined up and get that uh, investment going. But I think it's doable. It's doable. Um, it's just that it's going to take a big push to do it. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a commitment, I guess, obviously from the vessel operator. But more over the regulators and, and possibly the, um, as you say, an offshore wind and another renewable um, resource um, yeah. uh, uh, offshore. Um, if if they have a commitment to, to achieve re uh, decarbonisation, then uh, or, or a requirement, then hopefully that will lead to greater production. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, of, of these fuel types. 
Um, and and uh, on the on the HBO group or, or, uh, a little further down the line uh, in terms of commercial use, um, are we producing it in the UK or is it solely in mainland Europe? It's in, it's imported. It's 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 imported. There's no refining capability in the UK at the moment. Yeah, and, and you see that uh, similar to what Jonathan is saying, you see that as a, um, coming to the UK in the future if demand increases. So I was. Um, uh, that was a question from Mark, but I was just saying similar to what Jonathan was saying there. Uh, um, the, if the demand increases, you see that, that sort of aspiration and ambition from the UK. Um, I feel manufacturers to, to get involved. I think so. I think at the moment the predominant manufacturers of the of, of the product are quite happy sitting in Europe at the moment, and with the high the highest demand there, and 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 shipping over cargoes every now and then to the UK. But if the demand suddenly spiked, then I I can't see why they wouldn't look at, at some form of refining capability in the UK. It's difficult. It's difficult to find that capability in the UK. There has to certainly be a tipping point, I would say, to make it very attractive for the refiners to, to want to look at that that fuel. Um, the demand would have to significantly increase, but I can't see why not if that does happen. Yeah, and, and I guess one thing that might be influencing on uh, in one of the, the um, comments that has come up in the, in the, in the question and answer uh, section there is uh, how the UK government is uh, applying duty to HVO fuels. Is it currently considered a, a white diesel or a, a red diesel? It's... It's exactly the same, Andy. So, so it's exactly the same as diesel duty. If it's for off-road purposes, it has the off-road duty, um, 11.14. If it's for on-road purposes, then it would be um, uh, the same as, as normal diesel, 57.95. So it's just a duty difference, um, as is with normal diesel. Yeah, and, and do you think, um, have you had any discussions about a, a further reduction in duty? If, if it could be um, considered a, a green fuel type that well to wheel is reducing uh, emissions. No, we've not not seen anything yet. I mean, it's in, an interesting point because that's that's kind of if you look at Scandinavia, some of the Scandinavian countries. I know Latvia is using it across the pumps. A lot, a lot of um, Estonia are, are are as well, and then a lot of the Scandinavian countries are using it just at the fuel stations, and it's and it's heavily subsidised, um, government subsidised, which has led to people just going to a station, putting it in their cars, um, you know, just 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 like we are with diesel and petrol, um, and that's kind of show that they're, they're, they're quite advanced from that side of things. Um, but in the UK, we're not really succeeding at the moment with having that, you know, a, a, a subsidy, um, and, and and it doesn't look like that will change in the in the near future anyway. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, Mark. We're moving towards Martin um, on the subject of HPO still. Um, uh, comments come in. Um, some engine suppliers, such as Cummins and Yamaha, are still not in favour of using HPO. Uh, the question is why. Um, as Mark said, it complies with the N15490, um, which I understand is the requirement for um, fuel um, in, a, in a combustion engine. Can you expand on that, Martin? Um, well, I can't obviously under, I can't comment on why some of the other engine manufacturers are not uh, approving it. I can only imagine it's down to some of the byproducts within the combustion effort of the engine whether it's um, attacking some of the components or affecting performance. But I can't, you know, I mean, I've got no idea why Cummins and Yanmar and one or two of the other uh, engine manufacturers are not proven it currently. But from an MAM perspective, um, you, you obviously do approve the use of the... Yes. Of the yeah. 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 I mean, there's certain horsepower or power um, restraints, but by and large, it, it, it's across the range. Okay, and, and those um, limits, would you sort of impose that on the certificate when you issue the engine? Yes. Are you, yeah, so you would sort of advise the operator. Um, well, it's, not it's, it. it's prior to that, Andy. It's when we're doing the application. We yeah. would advise, you know, if, if they mention, if, if, if the uh, biofuel is mentioned earlier on, then we can advise what power ratings we can use. But it's growing every day. So yeah. by and large, as time progresses, it will be across the whole power range. Yeah, and, and what about like effects on compliance? Does that affect the type approval certificate? You know, do we have to no. get uh, any changes from classification? No, no, it, 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 it doesn't affect the compliance at all. The only area obviously it affects is when we start issuing uh, EIA PP certificates. 
Okay, and, and the, the uh, EIA PPI, I assume, set, shows a, a, a slightly lower figure. Obviously, the tailpipe output is very yeah. similar to the well-to-wheel. Yeah. Um, um, so I guess it's it, it, from from an MAM perspective, it's a um, you see it as a positive step um, in in emission reduction. Um, I mean, yeah, yes, it is, and I mean, in, in all honesty, and Mark touched on it just now from the inquiries that we've had for it one of the biggest problems is infrastructure is supply of the product but from a engine manufacturer yeah it, it's approved um, we can use it if it's available great great cool um uh, on the tier three side um which obviously i assume the intention with, with momentum if demand does increase and um uh, government and other um, bodies uh, desire us to use this um, uh, these alternative fuels. Um, tier three obviously would work in conjunction with this. I assume that would have no impact. That's a really good question, and I can't answer it. In fact, it's a question I've just written down to ask the factory as to whether we can use biofuels with things like SCR and DPF. Yeah, I mean, I assume it would be okay in the sense that the SCR is after um, at the exhaust. Um, yeah. I would, I would imagine the answer is yes, but I've written the question down, so I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Yeah, and, and, and on that note, is there a timeline for uh, a Tier 3 compliant engine availability for each of the engines? I assume that the 12V is ready to go. It's um, pretty much across the board. Again, there are a few limitations on power, especially at the top end, because obviously SCR um, has a big effect on exhaust temperatures. So, uh, but it's a it's across about 75 percent of the range yeah. mainly it, it's mainly the straight six and the v12 okay and so for your leisure engine obviously this is a work mode focus but it has somebody has asked is it the leisure smaller engine that you're getting there the stick the v6 and the 12 is ready um yeah well the straight six and 12 are ready the yeah. eight is yeah. coming on um uh, but tier two products going to be available for quite some, some considerable time anyway. So, great, great. And um, we're sort of coming towards an end. But I thought the question here, which is sort of outside of the general um, scope of today's discussion, but uh, experiences with the use of ammonia mm -hmm. um, for fuel tire. I, I guess Jonathan, perhaps we can start with you, um, uh, Martin, if, uh, afterwards, if there's any, uh, if you have any application um, experience. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very interesting question. Um, I think my, my first first point of my answer would be to say we need to always um, be a little bit sceptical about some of the claims being made. I mean, I've, I've been in this game uh, for about 15 years now, and, and I remember methanol has been, you know, there have been organizations pushing methanol as fuel of the future all that time, and it still isn't there. So I, I think we, we have to accept the fact that getting to that 300 million tons a year is a massive challenge, um, whatever fuel it is. Having said that, if I was a betting man, I I would put my money on on ammonia as a, a long term fuel option because I think it's got a lot going for it. Very interesting. Thanks, Jonathan. Martin, any application experience? No, um, not on the marine. I know that MAA in truck and bus are looking at it in terms of some of the on highway applications. So, which in turn will have a knock-on effect to what we're doing, but it's certainly from marine, no, not at the moment. Okay. Well, I think on, on, in light of Jonathan's comment there, and uh, not uh, not a betting man, but if he was to put his money down, it would be that we should probably uh, have a presentation on ammonia as one of our sessions. Um, and on that note, uh, as we said, a recording uh, will be sent to all delegates, all participants in this um, in this session. Thank you very much for attending. Um, we are set for our next session on the 8th of December. Um, that'll be at 10 a.m. Uh, Universal Time. Um, please register for the event. Um, the um, topic in general continues to look at uh, 2020 to 2025, uh, and we're looking at how we can re-engine and refit the fleet, uh, improve technologies uh, with a view, obviously, to decrease emissions, uh, including a greater expansion on the use of tier three uh, diesel engines. Um, so um, it's over to me to wrap up. Thank you very much to our presenters, uh, Dr. Jonathan Williams, Martin Jackson, and Mark Clouser. Uh, thank you very much to our participants and uh, look forward to seeing you all again on the 8th of December.